When taking square roots of numbers, you might notice that every positive number has a square root. Not just one, it has two square roots. But then you might notice that there is no such number which when squared is a negative number. There seems to be a gap. We can fill this gap by defining a new number i. We can define this new number as satisfying the equation i squared is equal to negative 1. One of the square roots of negative 1 would be i, but notice we have another square root, negative i. We can use these numbers to get square roots of all the rest of the negative numbers. To take the square root of a negative number, you can take the square root as if it were positive, but then multiply the result by i. An example might be helpful. The square root of negative 36 would be the square root of 36 times i, which would be 6i. But another square root would be negative 6i. Doing this for all the negative numbers would give us a whole new number line. It is like the normal number line, but each number is multiplied by i. Both of these lines share 0, so what if we put this new axis perpendicular to the real numbers? Doing this gives us a whole new plane of numbers. Each number on the plane would have some real part and some imaginary part, so each number on the complex plane can be represented by a plus bi. These might look like two different numbers, but they're actually just one number. Looking at this might remind you of the Cartesian plane, in which each coordinate is written with a horizontal component and a vertical component. This is why it is called the Cartesian form of complex numbers. This might also remind you of another way of naming each coordinate. That way would be polar coordinates. Instead of specifying the amount you need to go in each direction, you can specify the distance from the origin and the angle it makes with the horizontal. In the case of complex numbers, the distance from zero is called the absolute value, and the angle it makes with the horizontal is known as the argument of that number. There are two common ways to measure angles. There are degrees and then there are radians. Here's a little review of radians, just in case you're not familiar with them. Imagine you're on a unit circle. Now imagine instead of going in a straight line, you go one unit along the circumference. The angle you make with the horizontal is called one radian. Going around the whole circle, you would have traveled two pi radians, half the circle, pi radians, one fourth of the circle, pi over two, and so on. For the rest of the video, I'll be using radians to measure angles. Now, if we have an angle, how would we find the Cartesian coordinates? Well, the x coordinate is given by the cosine of the angle, and the y coordinate is given by the sine of that angle. We can use this to write down complex numbers with their absolute value and arguments. For our first example, let's use the absolute value of 1, which limits our number to being on this circle. The angle will specify exactly one number. We can write out our number like this, cosine of theta plus i times sine of theta. And if we change the absolute value, we need to just multiply each term by the absolute value. This notation works, but it's not very popular. To find out why, we need to look at how sine and cosine are defined. One way we can define these functions is by the Maclaurin series. These are Taylor series for sine and cosine centered at zero. These might look intimidating, but when you expand them, you see it's not that complicated. Notice, the more terms you add, the closer the approximation gets. And if you keep adding terms, the functions will be exactly the same. This is the Taylor series for cosine. You might see that the exponent in each term skips a number, but what if it didn't? We would get this series, and if we make all the terms positive, we get this function. It's quite an important function, known as exp of x, or alternatively, e to the x. If you don't know what e is, it's just a constant. There's a lot of different ways to define e, but right now, we can just think of it as approximately 2.718. Now, back to our series. What happens if we substitute i times x for x? e to the i x doesn't make sense as repeated multiplication, so we need to substitute it into the Taylor series. Everywhere we see an x, we can replace it with i times x. This is what we get after distributing the exponent. Now, we can simplify this a little bit. By definition, we know that i squared is equal to negative 1. But what is i to the third power? i to the third power is just i squared times i, which is negative 1 times i, which is just negative i. We can do a similar thing to find i to the fourth. i to the fourth is i squared times i squared, which would be negative 1 times negative 1, which is just 1. Then we see that i to the fifth power is just i. Since this is the same as i to the first power, we can see that our pattern is going to repeat after every four times. We can use this to simplify our series. This is what it looks like now. Some of the terms are being multiplied by i, and others are not, so let's separate them out. Here are the terms without i, and here are the terms with an i. Now, if you factor out an i from the bottom, these might start to look familiar to you. The top is the Taylor series for cosine effects, and the bottom is the Taylor series of sine effects. So we get the following identity e to the ix is equal to cosine of x plus i times sine of x. 
This is known as Euler's formula. Now, if you remember why we were doing this, it's so we can find a different way to write complex numbers in polar form. Previously, we were writing them as cosine of theta plus i times sine of theta. But now, using our identity, we can write the number in the form of e to the i theta. And in the same way we did earlier, we can just multiply by the absolute value. Let's take the complex number 3 plus 4i. We can calculate its absolute value by banking a right triangle and using the Pythagorean theorem. Using that, we get that the absolute value is 5. The argument can be calculated by this formula, where the RE function just returns the real part of that number, and the IM function returns the imaginary part. This formula only works for numbers which have a real part greater than 0. If the real part is less than 0, we can just add pi to that angle. The angle 3 plus 4i makes with the real number line is arctan of 4 over 3. So we can rewrite our number as 5 times e to the i times arctan of 4 thirds. Since angles don't change when we add 2 pi, we get that e to the i theta is equal to e to the i theta plus 2 pi. More generally, we can write e to the i theta is equal to e to the i theta plus 2 pi times n, where n is an integer. We can also use our formula to write real numbers in this form. For example, let's do the number 1. The absolute value of 1 is 1, and its angle would be 0 or 2 pi or so on. So we can rewrite 1 as e to the i times 2 pi. Let's try another example. Negative 1. The absolute value of negative 1 is 1. The angle negative 1 makes with the real axis is pi, so we get that e to the i pi is equal to negative 1. If we add 1 to both sides, we get that e to the i pi plus 1 is equal to 0. This equation is known as Euler's identity. This is often called the most beautiful equation in math. It relates some of the most famous numbers from math into just one equation. We know when we have real numbers, we have some operations we can do with them like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Since complex numbers are also numbers, how would we do these operations on them? Let's start off with addition. When they are in Cartesian form, you can just add the real parts and add the imaginary parts. To subtract, you would do the same thing, but first you need to multiply the number by negative one. Make sure to distribute the negative one before you add the numbers. Now, what about multiplication? To multiply, we can distribute each of the terms to the number. Using the distributive property, we can write this as 1 times 5 plus 3i plus 2i times 5 plus 3i. Then we distribute each of the terms to the inside. Doing that gives us 5 plus 3i plus 10i plus 6i squared. But we know that i squared is equal to negative 1. So we can put that in to get 5 plus 3i plus 10i minus 6. Then we can combine like terms to get negative 1 plus 13i. Let me plot these numbers. These are the numbers we are multiplying, and this is their product. If you look at this for a long time, you might notice that the product has an angle, which is the sum of the angles of the numbers we were multiplying. What about the absolute values? 1 plus 2i has an absolute value of square root of 5. 5 plus 3i has an absolute value of square root of 34. And the absolute value of their product is square root of 170. The absolute value of the product is the product of the absolute values. It turns out this is true for all complex numbers. Here's an explanation for why this might work for those of you who want to pause and read. Last thing I will cover is the division of complex numbers. Let's start off with an example in Cartesian form. To simplify, we need to multiply the top and the bottom by the complex conjugate. What is the complex conjugate and why would we do this? To get the complex conjugate of a number, you need to change the plus sign to a minus or vice versa. All right, but why would we do this? If we multiply two complex conjugates, we get an expression in the form of a plus bi times a minus bi. Recalling of the difference of squares, we get that this is equal to a squared minus b squared times i squared. And since i squared is equal to negative one, we get a real number. So when we multiply two complex conjugates, we get a real number. If we do this, we can get the denominator to be a real number. Now let's try this on 2 plus 3i divided by 1 plus 4i. First, we will multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate, which is 1 minus 4i. The top is equal to 14 minus 5i, and the denominator simplifies to 17. So our final answer is 14 seventeenths plus 5 seventeenths i. Now let's move on to the polar form. You might be able to guess that since in multiplication we add the angles and multiply the absolute values, that in division we would subtract the angles and divide the absolute values. If you were to do this on the previous example, you would see that you get the same answer. Let's do another example in polar form. 5 times e to the i times pi over 2 divided by 2 times e to the pi over 3 times i. 5 divided by 2 is 5 over 2, and pi over 2 minus pi over 3 is equal to pi over 6. 
So our answer is 5 over 2 times e to the i pi over 6. Now there is certainly a lot more to learn about complex numbers, but these are just the basics. If you understand the things discussed in this video, I think you have quite a solid foundation in complex numbers.